Hi, it's Dr. Centeno, and uh, welcome to our uh, national webinar. Uh, we'll get started now. We'll have other people, I'm sure, trickle in as we go. Uh, a few things uh, before we start. Um, one is that uh, this is a new system for us, meaning a new webinar system. We've used another system for many years. And uh, so this is only the second time we're using it, so hopefully uh, we're working out any small bugs as we go. But it's a more powerful system, so I think you'll get a lot more out of it. If you look in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, I have a screenshot of it there, uh, right, right here, uh, you'll see that there's an uh, area down there to type in a question. Now, if you type in a question, the default is it's going to uh, a chat, uh, you're, you're basically going to chat with staff experts. Now that's a real advantage because that way you can get your questions answered in real time and the staff experts that are we have online can answer you know, the vast majority of your questions. If you have a question specifically for me to answer at the end of the presentation, then you want to select the drop down that's right there, right on that little chat thing right here. Um, and that you can turn your chat into a question there um, and you select the question uh, box in the drop down. So uh, kind of a much more powerful system. In addition, notice right above that you can schedule a phone call and that means that if you still have questions or if you want to learn more information you can schedule a phone call at your convenience there where you can have one of our staff experts call you to talk more about the procedure, um, so when that's convenient for you. So those are two things to kind of know off the bat. Um, and then just some housekeeping, any references today to the Regenix C or cultured stem cell procedure, refer to an independently owned and operated facility in Grand Cayman that licenses our technology and where we take patients who require that more advanced technology. So we'll get started here uh, now that uh, it's time. So the presentation tonight is going to be what is Regenix, uh, helping patients avoid uh, more invasive surgery. And this is the overview. We'll discuss tonight the basics of platelets and stem cells. Who are we? Interventional versus surgical orthopedics. What is Regenix fit versus everything else? Uh, the basics of our procedure. What other types of procedures are being offered? Patients and data for each body area. And then we'll wrap it all up from there. So the basics. Uh, everything we do here is autologous, meaning we use your own cells. And there's some real advantages to that. That really enhances the safety profile. And I'll talk a little bit later in the presentation about why we don't use uh, any foreign cells uh, in the work that we do. We offer a broad array of regenerative procedures. In fact, if you look out there, there's really no one else that offers a broad array like this. We offer various different types of platelet procedures. So most of the folks that are offering platelet procedures are kind of a one-trick pony. They've got one thing they can do. Uh, not us. We've got many, many different kinds of platelet procedures. Those are the two big broad categories that you see on the screen there. Uh, in addition, we have uh, a same base stem cell procedure that isolates stem cells in a same surgical procedure. And then we have a culture procedure that grows the cells to much bigger numbers. Now, to focus on platelets, uh, really two different things that we do, although we have many different iterations of these, uh, meaning we're in our third generation platelet plasma, platelet rich plasma procedure our fourth generation platelet lysate procedure. So PRP or platelet-rich plasma is when we concentrate platelets and we make a very specific mix of those and we can make what's called SCP or super concentrated platelets to get platelet levels to much higher numbers than other physicians can muster. And the goal there is that those platelets will degranulate and enhance some repair. In platelet lysate, we've stripped all of the growth factors out of those platelets to enhance repair. So what are the different stem cell types? We've talked about different platelet things. Let's talk about stem cells. From a 30,000 foot view, uh, stem cells can be broken down into adult stem cells, embryonic stem cells, and uh, really artificial stem cells, induced pluripotent stem cells. 
we use only adult stem cells in what we do. And what is an adult stem cell? If you really think about it at its simplest, it's a basically a blank slate cell that can turn into other cells when repair is needed. And in addition to that, it can orchestrate a repair response, which is really critical about how these cells work. So if we use a construction site metaphor to help you understand all this, platelets are kind of like espresso shots for, uh, that are given to the workers to make them work harder and faster. Stem cells are this curious mix of a general contractor who can recruit more subcontractors, but can also turn into the bricks and mortar um, at the end of the day. So uh, if it's a cartilage repair job, they can theoretically turn into cartilage. Um, but they can also help orchestrate that whole repair response. We offer two different kinds of stem cell procedures, which is very unique. Uh, very few clinics have the ability to do this. We offer a same day procedure where their cells are harvested, isolated, and reimplanted in that same day. And a cultured procedure where the cells are harvested and grown to much bigger numbers over a few weeks. You can also cryopreserve those for future use at your current biologic age. So two different types of stem cell procedures. Now, who are we? That's always a good question. Um, well, these are all the different places we've been, plus many others through the years. Uh, lots of different uh, articles have been written on what we do. And we're the original orthopedic stem cell procedure since uh, 2005, meaning that there's no one else in the US who has more experience doing this. Uh, there's no one else who's even a close second. I think the closest close second would be a provider that started in 2009. Uh, and there's a lot of monkeying around with those numbers on the internet. You see guys have been doing this a year or two, claim to have been doing it for 10 years. Uh, again, not the case. Uh, we started this work in 2005. We're the only folks in the U.S. doing it at that point, and it wasn't until 2009 uh, until someone else decided that they would uh, try to replicate what we were doing. And we've treated thousands of stem cell and platelet patients. That's our uh, platelet. That's our. I'm sorry. Uh, patient count there on the left, 29,689. Uh, and that's important because, again, we'll see some sites throwing up a number uh, that looks something like this, but it includes all the surgery cases they've ever done that had nothing to do with uh, platelets or stem cells. On the right there, uh, that number used to be 33%, but as of Friday, we had a major paper published, uh, 2,372 uh, patients. And in that 2372 patients, that was a safety paper, but that's the largest safety paper ever published in any type of clinical use of stem cells for any indication, including cardiac, orthopedic, brain, uh, nerve, etc. So uh, we were very proud to do that, and that increased the N of the patients that we have published to 50%. So 50% of all the patients who have had their experience published and the peer-reviewed medical literature are our patients. And we're adding, obviously, thousands of procedures each year to our treatment registry. So let's start with a 30,000-foot view of orthopedics and stem cells. Uh, you can have, uh, obviously, injections or surgery when it comes to orthopedic-type care. Now, we call uh, precise injections, and these are some pretty complex procedures nonetheless interventional orthopedics. So surgical orthopedics is not really doing all that well. It's been a very rough 10 years for surgical orthopedics in the research. Basically, large studies have shown that knee arthroscopy, which is the most common surgery in the United States, is really no better than placebo. It doesn't matter if you're getting a meniscus surgery. It doesn't matter the reason they're doing the meniscus surgery. It's all no better than a fake or placebo surgery. So it's still amazing at some level that insurance companies are still covering these procedures because the academics have declared them to be relatively worthless with regard to their effect over a fake surgery. Uh, we have knee and hip replacement prostheses that are failing too soon and releasing wear particles, which is causing uh, tissue problems. Fusion for the spine and other joints is a problem because when we fuse a joint, we then overload the joints uh, above and below. So if you fuse an SI joint, you end up getting hip arthritis, 
or low back arthritis. If you fuse a portion of the spine, you end up uh, getting arthritis above and below. Fuse the ankle, you're going to get arthritis above and below, etc. And tendon and ligament surgeries are interesting because, as an example, we don't even have any high-level research showing that an ACL reconstruction actually helps people in the long run. Uh, we don't have high-level research that shows that a rotator cuff tear repair helps patients in the long run. So it's a very interesting time in orthopedics. A lot of what we believe to be true, that these surgeries were really helping patients, turns out not to be true when we test it out, or there really isn't much information to rely on that's high level. So because of that and this trend in orthobiologics, orthobiologics are uh, doing more and more sophisticated things through a needle, injecting stem cells, platelets, growth factors, etc. Orthopedics is going to radically change. So way back 16 years ago, uh, almost everything was surgery. There was just a, a few injections that were done, maybe some steroid injections here and here, here or there. By last year, we saw that switch. We saw many more injections happening. Many tendon surgeries went away for tendon pain. And we saw more and more physicians injecting things like platelet-rich plasma into tendons. So the surgical rates went down. And I believe by 2030, that's going to flip. We're going to see many, many more injections done with increasing precision, done using many different types of orthobiologics, and done using ever more sophisticated approaches, replace most of orthopedic surgery. So by 2030, I would expect that most elective orthopedic surgery would be way, way down. Um, having gone the way of the dinosaur, just like coronary artery bypass grafting went the way of the dinosaur in the 1990s, meaning cabbage surgeries for open heart. All of that stuff is now done through a needle. It's all done percutaneous through the wrist or the groin. We can put in whole valves right now through the groin uh, without the need for cracking the chest at all. The same thing will happen in orthopedic care. So if stem cells allow for needles to do potentially great things, how important is it that we actually get the cells precisely where we want them? And right now, if you look at how physicians do this work and inject, we can break it down into three different categories. We have uh, blind procedures, which are about 50% of all procedures out there. So uh, what does a blind procedure mean? It basically means that the doctor is not using any type of guidance. They're kind of just using palpation, trying to get it in the joint. There really is no guarantee that they actually get it in the joint. Um, in fact, many studies show that many times it's not. So if you're getting any kind of stem cell or platelet procedure, in 2016, there is no rationale to accept a blind procedure without ultrasound or x-ray imaging fluoroscopy type guidance. It's just completely inappropriate in 2016. It's below the standard of care, which is now guidance. So don't let anyone inject a joint in you ever without using guidance. That's completely inappropriate in 2016. Might have been fine for 1999, but in 2016, not so much. So then there's low accuracy guide injections. And that's what most doctors do that say they inject things. And that means that they can kind of get it in the joint under guidance, but they're not really trying to get it into specific parts of the joint. So uh, that's about between those two, 95% of what's out there. And the vast majority of doctors, again, when you hear that, that they use guidance, that's what they do. And then there's precise guide injections, which is what we do. And that's the minority of doctors out there. What we're doing, for instance, if you hear someone that's using ultrasound or fluoroscopy, we're doing something here at Regenix several levels above that. We are placing those cells in very precise parts of the joint. So as an example, uh, what you see here is a needle coming off from uh, the right. You can see the needle injecting into the superior labrum. Now, first off, this is a patient who would have to have massive surgery to repair that superior labral tear, that slap tear. Literally, what would have to happen is they'd have to detach the biceps tendon in many instances. They would uh, then have to reattach things, sew things up, big surgery. But instead here, uh, the doctor guided this needle under uh, ultrasound guidance, 
And then the last uh, little bit, we turned on the uh, live x-ray to be able to make sure we could demonstrate that the cells were going into the superior labrum, which is where they're going here. Again, there are probably only 200 U.S. physicians who have the skills to do this procedure, and probably uh, only 50 or 60 that could pull it off right now. So very, very few physicians are trained at this level to do this kind of procedure. Um, so they might say they use ultrasound to inject a shoulder, but at this level, they're not practicing there. So how about surgery plus stem cells? Uh, well, one of the interesting things is, while there are a few instances where we would say um, that makes sense, uh, for the most part, we don't think it's necessary, meaning that most of what we do replaces surgery. Now, there are some times where something might need to be done. A huge bone spur that's causing a problem might need to be taken off. Uh, again, most bone spurs are fine where they are. Um, in fact, they're there to stabilize the joint. Or maybe there's a huge um, piece of cartilage floating around the joint that might need to be removed surgically. Um, but the vast majority of our patients don't go their surgical route at all. They skip it. So in short, what Regenix is doing is not what you see out there, the magic stem cell clinic that sprinkles, sprinkles a little magic stem cell pixie dust on something, and it seems to magically get better. We're doing precise interventional orthopedics. And again, at the level we're doing it, there are a few physicians in the United States that are trained at that level to do this. So we don't know if someone might say they're board certified or they're an orthopedic surgeon doing some injections or they're a pain management guy doing some injections. They don't know how to do most of these injections because these are at a higher level than they're operating. Now, we have a nonprofit, the Interventional Orthopedics Foundation, that we were... Uh, that, that we started um, and is now bringing in many other uh, participants and many other stakeholders who want to do this kind of work that will be involved in educating physicians how to do this. So we'll see more and more physicians uh, doing things at the level that Regenix is doing them in the future. And we're devoted to educating physicians to make sure that they're doing interventional orthopedics and not just schlocking it into a joint. So let's go to a 10,000 foot view now. Where does Regenix fit versus everything else? Well, the first thing is we're, we're not a bedside machine. So the vast majority of doctors doing any kind of uh, fat grafting work or any kind of bone marrow work, bone marrow stem cell work, they're using these small, um, uh, simple bedside machines. The problem with that is that the doctor really doesn't know much about the processing. It's kind of a one-size-fits-all thing. All the doctor knows is this is where the start button is. You put the kid in there, you press that button, and that's, that's the extent of their knowledge. Uh, obviously, uh, we're not that because each one of our providers has an uh, in-house lab where, where they can tailor, they can use our protocols to tailor the biologics to your need. So, for instance, you might need uh, 20 times concentrated platelet-rich plasma injected with your stem cells to give you the best chance of a recovery. Um, and a 20-year-old athlete might only need seven times concentrated stem cells in that same spot. So we can make those adjustments with the in-house lab that you really can't do in these one-size-fits-all machines. So we're not that. We're also not an online training course. So we're seeing many, many doctors take weekend courses who are not qualified to do this work. They take a weekend course. The weekend course will really teach anyone with a heartbeat and a driver's license how to do this. And that's not what we are either uh, because we extensively train our providers. We extensively select our providers. Uh, so the vast majority of folks out there uh, aren't qualified to do this kind of work. So what is our process? Uh, we innovate in the lab. We perform clinical research, uh, as you'll see. We track patients in a registry. We use data to guide treatment decisions, and then we publish that, like that huge paper, uh, 2,372 patient safety paper we just published on Friday. Again, the largest paper of its kind for any indication in stem cells with regard to safety. How could we do that? We've been doing this on the orthopedic side longer than anyone else. That's actually 
Again, an orthopedic-focused paper, if I hadn't said that. So clinical research. Um, we do a lot of publishing. Um, we are now publishing three to four papers a year. And I really caution you on this in this area, because this is an area where there's a lot of bait and switch going on. And what do I mean by bait and switch? What that means practically is that unlike Regenix, where we're putting, we're doing our own research on all of these procedures we do, putting it online for patients to see, getting it peer reviewed. So the research on our site is what we, it's research on what we do and how well it works or doesn't work, whatever, whatever the case may be. Uh, however, what you see on a lot of websites that are out there is research that has nothing to do with what that clinic is doing. Some of it's ours and they're using a completely different procedure. Some of it um, might be related to cultured uh, mesenchymal stem cells and not related to the stromovascular fraction fat stuff that, that the clinic uses. So be very, very careful. Most of the research you see out there on websites has absolutely nothing to do with what that clinic is doing. It is solely there to try to convince you that there's a lot of research in what's being done, but usually there is not. Uh, we have the world's largest patient registry tracking more orthopedic stem cell treated patients than anyone else worldwide. Uh, we use big data biostatistics, including uh, most recently uh, starting to work with neural networks trying to find predictors uh, on which patients uh, would do the best based on certain elements. In this, in this case, it's a knee microenvironment study that I'll show you a little bit later. Other clinics are just not doing that kind of work right now. Uh, in addition, as I've said before, we've published a lot of research. Now, I haven't updated this graph on the left here yet. Uh, I just did the update to this this weekend after our paper published, but I, I did calculate the, the number again. So uh, used to be 33%, now it's 50% of the, of the patients that have had their results published on bone marrow orthopedic stem cell research. 50% of those are our patients. Uh, so that, that's pretty amazing. Uh, if you go on PubMed right now and you, know, you look at who's published what, again, 50% of it by the number of patients is our research. Uh, and no other clinic can make that claim anywhere. So these are just some of our papers. Again, I, I've got to update this from the one I did this weekend. Uh, that one, regrettably, is sitting on my computer at home, so I didn't get a chance to do that today. But I did update the number uh, from 33% to 50%. Uh, on the lab research side, uh, what's really unique about Regenix is we have all of the toys here at our Colorado main research lab that any uh, stem cell lab in a uh, university in the country would have, and in fact, a few toys that many of those labs don't have. Uh, so we've been very fortunate in that we've had the resources to reinvest an awful lot of money in research, and we continue to do that research. We have PhD clinical research teams. We have PhD uh, lab research teams, and we're constantly trying to improve what we do. Again, not the case out there. Pretty much every clinic out there has borrowed a protocol from somebody else, is buying some off-the-shelf kit, or is using some bedside centrifuge, and there's no research that's being done to improve any of that. It's all pretty static. It is what it is. So uh, very proud of, of what we do there. Um, I'm going to skip this one. This is kind of just walking through the, the research lab. Uh, just in case there are any bandwidth issues with this new um, software we're using. Now, one of the interesting things is we can do a lot with that research. Um, you might say, well, that's all great, you're doing this research, but what's it for? Well, here's an example of what it's for. Uh, in 2012, we asked the question, is it possible that there are more stem cells in bone marrow than, uh, than everyone believes? Um, is it possible that the one fraction within bone marrow that everyone goes after really since the 60s to get stem cells is not all there is? There are other fractions in there that we can isolate to get stem cells for our patients. And it turned out that we were right. There were other places to look in the same bone marrow sample for stem cells. 
And what you see on the right there is a comparison that we were able to do between the old procedure getting less stem cells and the new procedure getting more stem cells in near arthritis patients, showing a very nice difference between the two techniques, um, meaning better results for the new procedure that got more stem cells. So we can get a lot more stem cells out of the same marrow than uh, anyone else out there, which has really turned out to be helpful for our knee arthritis patients. In addition, here's another good example of, of how we're constantly innovating. Uh, these are uh, cytokine and growth factor levels from the synovial fluid, meaning the fluid inside knees. This, this is before and after a procedure. And we're using this data um, to uh, decide if we can use chemical markers within the knee to try to see who is a really good category for this type or a really good patient for this kind of care. And maybe there's certain profiles within the knee that say you shouldn't do this type of work. You should do something else. In addition, we're also using this data to try and clean up that bad soil. So if you were a farmer, you would test the soil. If the soil was missing certain things, you would fix that and you would supplement those things before you threw your seeds in the soil. So in the same way, can we fix the microenvironment inside a knee so that that knee is, is more susceptible to a positive outcome with stem cells? Again, no one's doing work at this, at this level. Not even in universities are they at the point where they're trying to perfect a clinical technique. They're still doing animal research and maybe some early clinical trials. But those clinical trials are fixed in space. What we're at now, we're at the mastery level, so we're trying to decide what can we do to improve our patients' outcomes even further. So let's go over the basics of our stem cell procedure. Um, cells are collected from a bone marrow aspirate at the back of the hip. Uh, we take an IV blood sample. We can isolate cells out the same day. Uh, or uh, only down in Grand Caymans, we can go ahead and culture those to bigger numbers and cryopreserve them and save them for future use. Now, one of the things I hear from patients just as they hear it is they have this sense that a bone marrow aspiration is painful and awful. And we actually looked at that uh, way back in 2009. And at that point, about 9 out of 10 patients told us it was no big deal. Uh, we took the time to properly numb these patients as we do now. In addition to that, recognize that this is not a bone marrow biopsy, but a bone marrow aspirate. A bone marrow biopsy is different than an aspirate. So we, we do the aspirate, uh, not the biopsy. And um, again, if it's appropriately numbed, as you can see, nine, nine out of 10 of 44 consecutive patients told us this was no big deal. So what else is out there? You know, you've heard something about Regenix now. You have some sense of what we do. What else is out there? The three things I'm going to cover are uh, same-day fat stem cell treatments, uh, amniotic stem cell treatments, or you might think of them as fetal, uh, and Regenikine orthokine, which is mostly in Germany, but there are a few sites in the U.S. that are doing this. So one of the things you often hear as a common refrain from clinics that use fat, and we've published on the use of fat and bone marrow in uh, in knees. We did not find any help uh, with the addition of fat stem cells in knee arthritis. But one of the things you hear uh, frequently is that uh, fat's got a lot more stem cells than bone marrow. Uh, absolutely not true. If you uh, look at this, this is really a fifth grade math error. And I only know it's a fifth grade math error because I last year I had a fifth grader and they were working on division. So it's a division error. Basically, uh, they're, they're not uh, comparing apples to apples when they make that comparison. Um, so it's not true at all that fat has many more stem cells than bone marrow. It's, that's based on a division error. The other th really interesting thing that we're seeing right now, we're seeing this explode out there, is amniotic stem cells. And I put that in air quotes, stem cells, stem cells because there's really no stem cells to be had. And what I mean by that is that you'll see doctors that claim to be using embryonic, fetal, or amniotic, or placental derived cells. Um, so the names to look out for are placental derived, chorionic, amniotic. Um, sometimes the doctors will err and call them embryonic. They're not. 
uh, sometimes patients will conceptualize them as fetal stem cells, um, but these are stem cells from a, uh, a live birth. Um, and the problem is that we got real excited about this about two years ago. We said, wow, wouldn't it be great if these reps that were coming to our office trying to sell us these vials of amniotic tissue, um, they were really stem cells in those vials. Now, unlike other physicians who would just take this at face value, and say, great, if you say it's good enough for me, we actually tested it in our advanced lab to try to see is there anything in here that's living that we can recover by following their directions. And the answer was there was nothing living at all. So this is all a scam. Uh, now, it may not be a scam from the standpoint that these things have growth factors and they might help some pain in some patients, but you can get those same growth factors at higher levels just by a simple PRP shot, platelet-rich plasma shot. Uh, and these clinics are bringing patients in thinking that they're getting a stem cell treatment. The doctors, many of them don't even know that they're not using stem cells, but these, these vials of stuff, amniotic tissue that they're injecting, um, or placental tissue, these are all dead. In fact, most of these are terminally sterilized. That means that they are required to be sterilized by gamma irradiation by the FDA before they're sold. So nothing survives gamma irradiation. So uh, this is a scam. This is as close to consumer fraud as you can get. Uh, be very, very cautious of anything like this uh, because there are there's no such thing right now as any live stem cell that any physician can purchase for use. So anyone that tells you that you're getting uh, baby stem cells or placental stem cells or fetal stem cells or amniotic stem cells, um, is committing consumer fraud because there's nothing living in these vials of this stuff that these doctors are injecting. So doesn't Germany have some really cool things to offer? I think I kind of heard that Kobe Bryant went over there and he got something cool. And the answer is what that is is called uh, orthokine in Germany. Uh, here some doctors have been calling it regenokine. And what's interesting is it's basically a natural serum-based anti-inflammatory shot. Um, if you talk to the U.S. vets that use this, it lasts for about six to nine months. And uh, again, the veterinarians here have been using it for a very long time, at least a decade. Um, but it's not a regenerative medicine solution. It's, uh, and if you look at the data, you'd probably be better off getting a PRP shot uh, at the end of the day, rather than spending so, uh, six or seven or eight or nine or ten thousand dollars on a series of these shots. Um, you know, the guy down the street who can give you a PRP shot for a grand is probably better when you compare it head to head. So again, not, not something to spend big bucks on. So now we're going to go into patients and data. Um, you know, I, I'm going to present some patient stories, um, which are good stories, interesting stories. Patients generally like to hear stories about other patients. Um, and then I'm going to present some data. Uh, I'm not going to go over the peer-reviewed publications that we have. Those are on the website. Um, so again, the peer-reviewed publications that we have are on the website. Uh, there's 15 of them or so there. That's in a different section. I'm going to focus on the data that's more patient-friendly, and those are infographics that we put out. So who are our patients? Um, weekend warriors, active elderly, professional athletes, uh, young athletes, uh, dramatically injured. We see them all. Uh, we see a lot of professional athletes uh, and we see a lot of, of weekend warriors as well. Um, a lot of folks who really just want to stay active. They've been active all their lives. Something has happened and um, they basically have been told they need major surgery. So as far as safety is concerned, um, really there isn't a procedure in stem cells that is as well studied as Regenix. Um, we've had multiple different publications, um, including third parties published on our safety. Uh, these are physicians uh, in Europe, this, this journal that you see up here, Osteoarthritis and Cartilage, that we didn't even know, uh, that asked for our, our source data and then published a paper saying um, that what we were doing was uh, was far safer than hyaluronic acid injections injected in a knee. Those are knee gel shots or rooster comb shots. Um, and many other papers as well, including uh, the newest paper, which I didn't put on here yet, which was just published, uh, 2,372 patients. On the right there, you can see an infographic that's online that will get updated here pretty soon. Um, 
where we can go ahead and, and update that uh, to several thousand patients. Um, but a lot of information has been published on uh, Regenix procedure safety. In general, what do we treat? Uh, we treat arthritis, meniscus and labral tears, ACL tears, other ligament tears like the MCL, tendon issues uh, like rotator cuff tendons. And here I'll review knee, uh, then hip, then shoulder, uh, foot and ankle, hand and wrist, and then we'll go over spine. Now, this is usually a good time if you want to get up and get a coffee break um, or go to the bathroom. This is a good time to do it because I'll go in that order. I'll start with knee and I'll end with spine so that if you're interested in spine, you may want to go now. If you're only interested in knee, you may want to hear that, take a five-minute break and come back, and then we'll, we'll wrap all this up, and I'll take some questions. So in knee, uh, patient stories. On the left, this is a... Uh, an elite high school basketball player um, who got a meniscus tear and her father was smart enough to know that if she had had meniscus surgery at her age, the likelihood of having arthritis in that knee by age 30 was about two-thirds. So he didn't want her to go that route, he wanted her to get stem cell root and this is uh, what she said about her experience. And then on the right, this is just a mom who got to the point of saying, you know, I, I, I want to do a triathlon, I know I can do this but started training and had pretty severe uh, patellofemoral pain, meaning uh, pain at the back of her kneecap due to cartilage loss. So those are two different stories, two different kinds of patients. This is a professional football player who we were able to help get another, uh, another year in the NFL. He was kind of at the end of his career, and he had basically said, you know what, uh, I just want to play one more year, uh, but he had been told by the surgeons that that was impossible. Uh, he had had multiple failed knee surgeries and that there was no way that he could go back to playing and we got him that extra year, which was great for him and his family. He got to, to earn one more year of money, put some money away for uh, his future. Uh, this is uh, knee arthritis data. Uh, this is as of last fall, so uh, fall 2015. Um, and these are that's the pain scale up there on the right, uh, so it shows you that going down over time. Uh, and uh, this is lower extremity function uh, going up over time down here. So this is a, a validated functional questionnaire that we give our patients. Um, and one of the interesting things is our, one of our doctors in Chicago who was a real uh, uh, expert in joint replacement, uh, used to do joint replacements in 2007. He collected a bunch of data for Zimmer um, uh, on a joint replacement prosthesis. And then he had the foresight to say, hi, I wonder how this works if I start uh, using the same metrics to collect data on my uh, Regenix same day knee patients. So you can see here the uh, before and after functional scores, the before and after assessment scores, gives you some sense that, you know, really pretty good performance for um, a, uh, for a same-day stem cell injection versus an amputation of the joint with insertion of prosthesis, which at the end of the day is what a knee replacement is all about. So can stem cells help ACL tears? Uh, yes, we do treat ACL tears. Um, and uh, this is a good exemplar of that. You can see here on the left, this ghost-like image of the ACL. Uh, and the ACL should look uh, like what it looks like on the right. On the right here, you can see a nice, dark, um, full tendon. And so this was, uh, on the left, this was read out as full uh, or complete ACL tear. On the right, uh, this was read out as normal ACL three months later by the reading radiologist. So this is a woman from Singapore who flew here to have her ACL treated because we were one of the few places on earth that did this procedure and were the ones that invented it. So um, she got us to treat uh, her knee and obviously she was very happy that she goes back three months later, gets an MRI and the reading radiologist you know, reads it out as normal ACL because she was looking at major ACL reconstruction surgery. Uh, let's talk a little bit about hip arthritis. Uh, these are two different stories. On the left here, this is a dancer with a hip labrum tear who has mild arthritis. And this is someone who kind of knew that she was dancing with a ballet troupe at a high level, that if she had hip labrum surgery, it was very unlikely that she was going to uh, get back to dancing at the same level. 
Um, so we were able to help her, and this is a statement that she sent us in a picture she, uh, she sent us of her dancing in Germany. On the right is just a guy who wanted to be able to ride bikes with his buddies, and he couldn't do it anymore because of a bad hit. Um, so one of the things that you should know is that uh, when we compare hip outcomes to knee outcomes, hips tend to underperform, and that's been pretty universal uh, based on anyone that's ever presented any data on same-day hips. We have the most data on same-day hips by far, but I have seen people in conferences present 50 hip patients or 60 hip patients, obviously not, um, not 600. So as you can see here on the Oxford hip scale, um, you know, we did meet the minimal clinical important difference, um, and pain generally went down, but you should know that when we see older patients with more severe degenerative disease in their hip, whose hips are locked in, um, those patients tend to underperform uh, patients that are younger with hip arthritis um, or, or who have hip arthritis that's not as severe. So if we look at um, hips with regard to the same day and cultured procedure, in general, we, we tend to see better results in the culture procedure than the same day procedure when it comes to hips. So something to keep in mind uh, where we, we may not see as big a difference in knee arthritis with these two procedures, but for hip arthritis, we do see a difference. Uh, shoulder, uh, these are two stories here. On the left, this is a, a gentleman who is a uh, Olympian, two-time Olympian, who basically had a massive rotator cuff tear during his career. It ended his career. He had, had it stitched together. You know, five, six years later, the whole thing fell apart, and he didn't want to undergo that surgery again, so he was actually treated by Dr. Bletcher out in, uh, in L.A. At our, at our clinic there, who did a very good job with his shoulder and um, was very happy with the results that he didn't have to undergo that second surgery. Uh, on the right is a Pilates instructor, and she just wanted to get back to that point of being able to teach, and she couldn't take a lot of time off. She, she was unacceptable to her to be in that pillow immobilizer, and she just said, no, I'm not doing that. Um, so she did this instead. She had very little downtime, was able to get back much, much more quickly. Uh, I've arranged the data differently here. This is 346 um, procedures uh, as of last year in the shoulder. Uh, you can see here pain, function, and percent improvement rating that are all kind of uh, aligned there at the different time points. And again, all of these infographics are, avail are available online. These are before and after uh, MRIs of the shoulder. On the left here, you can see this is the rotator cuff, and you can see a large tear of the rotator cuff. That's what the red arrow is pointing to. Uh, here, uh, the after MRI, you see uh, no tear like that. Same thing here in another patient, uh, a nice big gap in the rotator cuff here, and then no tear afterwards. So uh, in particular, shoulder ro rotator cuff tears do very, very well. We have a randomized controlled trial in three areas, in knee osteoarthritis. Uh, that one's done recruiting. Uh, that one was done in Chicago. Uh, one is in shoulder rotator cuff tear, and that one's still recruiting. So that's uh, free care if you're willing to be randomized. Um, so that's, that's interesting. And then one in knee ACL. So if you know anyone with knee ACL problems, that one's still recruiting. But those are high-level randomized controlled trial studies uh, that are free to the patient. Uh, so in foot and ankle, uh, we have two patient stories on the left here. We have a patient with severe ankle arthritis and ligament injuries who really just wanted to be able to walk on the beach. Uh, and on the right, a, a woman who was told at the early age of 39 that she needed ankle fusion, and that blew her world up because uh, she was very active and didn't want to go that direction. Uh, this is a, uh, a Olympian, uh, Ciodoni Mothersill. Uh, she actually is a Cayman Olympian in track and a track star. And we were asked by the Cayman government to actually treat her, um, and this is her winning her own invitational uh, in Grand Cayman after uh, we treated her. So foot and ankle, uh, this data is about to be replaced on the site. It's going to be updated to about 200 uh, same-day cases, um, but this gives you an idea of what percentage improvement looks like between same-day and culture for foot and ankle. Uh, 
and on hand wrist on the left here uh, you see a, uh, a patient who had severe thumb arthritis um, and just a journalist who wants to be able to, to be a journalist and do things again and on the right uh, a, a woman who was told she needed a joint replacement in her um, uh, thumb joint and uh, who is a designer and unable to do that kind of work. Uh, this is some of the hand wrist data. Again, this is about to be updated on the website to, to bigger numbers. Uh, in spine, uh, one of the interesting things about spine with us is that we have a very, very big, broad spectrum of care. So these are some patient stories. So you see a woman on the left who wanted to be able to uh, plant coral. She wanted to repopulate the world's uh, coral wreaths. And uh, she got very into this and got to that point uh, where she was retired. This is what she'd always dreamed of doing. But she got there and she couldn't do it because we're back. And uh, they wanted to do a major fusion on her. We were able to uh, help her skip the fusion. She just had our DDD procedure, which is injection-based and platelet-based. Uh, that's her um, actually uh, planting coral again. Um, in the middle is a uh, very interesting guy. He's a... Uh, professional climber uh, and is a adventure writer. Has written several books um, and he hails from near us in Boulder uh, where there are a lot of climbers. And one of the really interesting things was he was involved in a rescue uh, in Nepal uh, of other climbers. And you know, in the middle of this rescue, he kind of thought to himself, "Oh my God, I can't believe I'm doing these things because these are not things I would have attempted before." Uh, I had this procedure. And on the right is just a mom who got to that place where she had a herniated disc in her back and was trying to avoid the steroid hit, the adverse things that, that epidural steroids can cause. Um, so we also routinely treat neck and upper back pain and headaches. And we have a very broad spine spectrum. Um, everything from platelet-based procedures to same-day stem cell procedures to cultured stem cell procedures and what's unique about what we do with spine is that we apply the least expensive technology that will work the best. So uh, we have figured out over the last 11 years of doing this work that platelet-based technologies will work well for this type of thing, and same-day stem cells work well for this, and cultured stem cells work well for that. Um, and if you really look out there, there's not a lot of that. It's basically one size fits all. If you've got a problem, whatever technology the doctor uses, tries to throw it in there and see if, see if he can throw it to the wall and see if it'll stick. So uh, this is some of the data that we put together that we are now getting published as well as some other registry data um, in the peer-reviewed literature. But basically it compared uh, platelet lysate, which was the growth factors isolated from the patient's own platelets, injected epidural um, for radiculopathy, meaning sciatica, um, against corticosteroid epidurals, and uh, the platelet lysate worked much better. So a, a natural solution that didn't expose the patient to all the risks of using high-dose steroids. Uh, this is just an example of a patient uh, who we treated with a uh, severe disc problem. I just put another one of these on the blog. It's, it's, she's hilarious. Uh, Eileen was just on the blog, and uh, she uh, does urban acrobatics. So if you go to the website and click on the blog, you'll see what I mean. I mean, she's, she's amazing. She, she had a disc stem cell procedure, um, and some of the stuff she does at age 31, I, I couldn't do when I was 21. But you'll, you'll see some of the crazy things that she does now that she's had her disc treated. And she was out for like 18 months. Um, and it's only the last six months that she chose to go this route, and she's doing great. Um, so another technology we offer is a cultured stem cell procedure where the goal is to get rid of a persistent disc bulge. The same-day stem cell procedure works well if you've got good disc height and a tear that's painful in a disc. The cultured stem cell procedure tends to work better for a persistent bulge that's sitting on a nerve where we're trying to get rid of that bulge without surgery. Again, no, no surgery here. This is an injection. Uh, so this is an example of that kind of disc bulge here. Uh, you can see pre and post. And then uh, this, is the, this is the side view here. This is the top view. You can see pre and post. 
And this is a paper that we're readying for publication now. Uh, we're finally publishing on much of this disk data that goes back to uh, really 2006. But the data that we'll be mostly publishing on is sort of 2008 experience through 2016. Um, but significant changes in most patients in disk bulge size as a result of using this very specific cultured stem cell procedure. So to wrap it all up, uh, to learn more, spend some time watching our videos. Uh, we really spend a lot of time on those videos trying to make things that are complex simple. Um, read our book. Uh, it's a bestseller uh, in uh, the, an Amazon Orthopedics. And it's a really great way to conceptualize how we approach these things. You know, um, and we put a lot of time and effort in this book. It's in its third edition. We'll, I'll probably do a fourth edition here uh, within the next six months or so um, because there's a lot of things that change in this uh, field. But it's very, very helpful. Uh, and it's not the only book we have. I also have another book called Proactive that you should really consider reading. Uh, Proactive is uh, on the website as well. And it's a, it's a really great way to kind of look at staying active. You know, we're all kind of aging athletes. And how does an aging athlete stay ahead of that curve? Um, and, you know, got lots of different copies in print. It's been downloaded lots of times. So another thing to consider is our lab-engineered stem cell support formula. Uh, unlike most people that would put together a supplement that just kind of read a few things and say, let's put a little of this, a little of that, a little of this, and sell it, uh, we actually did a full year of lab research to try to see what combination of supplement ingredients actually produce the best results with real human stem cells in vitro. So uh, this is actually one of the pictures we took of stem cells creating cartilage that were uh, stem cells that were exposed to various supplement ingredients. So we really took a lot of time with this supplement trying to put together something that we had uh, faith in that would help our patients. So what to look for in a clinic? Uh, obviously, as you've heard tonight, a protocol that's been used an awful lot. Make sure that the research you're not reading is bait and switch, because that's a big issue. Imaging guidance to take cells, imaging guidance to place cells. Um, again, specific outcome research on what that clinic does. Uh, a clinic that's constantly innovating, collecting and publishing data, um, has published research. And when you should run the other direction, be very careful about clinics that treat every A through Z disease, uh, meaning that you can get your um, uh, you can get your hair done, your cosmetics, uh, your knee done, multiple sclerosis, ALS, uh, you name it, they treat it all. Uh, it's just not credible uh, at all that a clinic could be good at all those things. Um, I'll spend the rest of my career just trying to continue to uh, advance that mastery in orthopedic stem cell use. Uh, one that promises extremely high success rates. I recently saw a paper that was really interesting. It was on a uh, fat um, stem cell technique for knee arthritis. And I looked at the results and I was like, wow, this, these results are amazing. I mean, they were almost perfect. Uh, and it was on a lot of patients, like a thousand patients. And I'm like, wow, this is just an amazing thing. And then, of course, as an expert, I dug deeper and I saw that the physicians in that paper, 60% uh, uh, of the input into the outcome came from the doctor. So the doctor had a 60% vote in whether or not the patient got better. So of course everyone got better. All doctors like to believe that their patients get better. And uh, for that reason that we never allow any physician input into outcome here at Regenix, meaning that um, you determine what that outcome is and that's what we eventually publish online. The doctor gets no say in it whatsoever. Uh, long on success story, short on data. Claims the doctor took a stem cell fellowship. Uh, this is a new, interesting thing, a, weekend, a series of weekend courses uh, being called a fellowship, which that's not a fellowship. A fellowship is a training program that lasts at least a year. Uh, the physician is not MD or DO. We're seeing many chiropractors getting into this and naturopaths. Nothing against chiropractors and naturopaths at all but certainly not qualified to do interventional orthopedics. And the clinic's just open, but somehow claims to have treated thousands of patients. In fact, this was a Texas clinic recently that uh, tried to replicate our counter on their website 
and somehow they had done 20,000 procedures. Now, they've only been doing this work for the last four years, and they've probably only done less than 500 procedures, but you know, I, I think what they did is they included the surgeons, uh, all of the surgeons' cases he'd ever done since coming out of residency. So again, be very, very careful on things like that because many of these clinics uh, have just opened. They're trying to create the, um, the sense that there's more experience there than there really is. Uh, in addition, uh, we have a provider network online. We're growing that slowly on purpose. Uh, we're taking very, very select uh, physicians into this network, and we have uh, sites all around the U.S., so check that out online. And it's very hard to get into our network. We turn away a lot of doctors. So one of the doctors recently, for instance, that we turned away was an internist, an internal medicine doctor. Again, not qualified to do this kind of work. Very interested, very enthusiastic, wanted very much to do this work. But the amount of training that would be required to get that doctor to do this well was prohibitive, and it was unlikely to ever occur. Um, so uh, wasn't a lot in our network. And you'll see many of these sites will take anyone on their, their network, and that's not the case for us. So in conclusion, uh, Regenix isn't magic pixie dust. Um, it's advanced and precise interventional orthopedics using your own platelets and stem cells. We've been doing this longer than anyone else out there. We've published more data online and in the peer-reviewed uh, literature than anyone else. And we spend more resources day-to-day -day improving our procedure than anyone else. And we've got more treatment options than, uh, than uh, what's out there. I mean, you see many one-trick ponies out there, and, and we're not that at all. So let me try to answer some questions. Um, so Barbara, how much recovery time? Uh, so uh, Barbara, it really depends on what we're doing. Um, but for instance, for knee osteoarthritis, uh, there's very little uh, recovery time. So basically the first three days after the procedure, we don't want you doing much. Uh, but then after that, you can start uh, doing things like workouts in the pool. You can start to uh, use an elliptical to stay in cardiovascular shape. And then we want you back at around six weeks uh, to your normal full activity. So much, much quicker than a surgery. Uh, uh, Laura, uh, stage four arthritis in the knee, almost no cartilage in the left knee, um, is a condition a, a candidate for stem cell therapy. Uh, so Laura, uh, yes. I mean, one of the interesting things about the same-day stem cell procedure is we've tried to look to see if the quality of your MRI or the severity of your MRI uh, impacts that. So at the end of the day, do patients with more severe arthritis on their x-ray or MRI have poorer results than those who have less severe arthritis? And we don't see that. Um, in fact, uh, it seems to be agnostic to that, this procedure. So what that means is someone with severe arthritis is getting about the same result as someone with mild arthritis. Um, so stage four arthritis of the knee is not a concern based on the registry data that we have to date. Um, bone on bone and hips for Rick. Yeah, uh, Rick, so for bone on bone and hips, that's a procedure that we would recommend not a same day, more a cultured type procedure. Um, and the other thing we're going to look at there is what the quality of that bone is. Frequently in hips, very, very different than knees, uh, the bone will start to die off um, and that'll happen fairly quickly. So um, the answer to your question is uh, that you'd only be considered a candidate for the culture procedure, not a same-day procedure. Um, and also, there are other things we would look at, such as your age, uh, the amount of range of motion in the joint, et cetera, to determine your ultimate candidacy. Have we treated bone-on-bone -on -bone hips successfully? Yes. Um, but you should know that the results underperform the knees. Uh, Let's see, uh, another question is, would this procedure work in a lateral collateral ligament on a knee that had a full replacement in 2002? Um, yeah, that shouldn't be an issue. If all we're doing is treating the lateral collateral ligament, that's easily accessible and has nothing to do with the, the actual knee replacement prosthesis or shouldn't. Um, and so that's something that can be treated in a patient who has had knee replacement. Um, Henry, in stage four arthritis with bone-on-bone, bone, left side of the left knee, yeah, I think I've answered that one already. 
Uh, you mentioned that people who need hip treatment do better with culture procedure. How would I get more info on that? Uh, yeah, so staff can get you info on the culture procedure. Um, you know, probably the best thing to do tonight would be to schedule a phone call with staff and they can get you all that information. You can also look up Regenix Cayman, C A M, uh, or I'm sorry, C A Y M A N. So Regenix Cayman, C A Y M A N, uh, which is a separate website. Uh, that uh, has information on the procedure uh, that's that we perform down in Grand Cayman on some of our patients that need that more advanced technology. Um, Paul, what is the determining factor that decides between a procedure in the Caymans or the states for a spine disc? I pinched nerves at L5S1 due to bulging herniation. Also have problems with the same disc at three and four. Um, yeah, so so Paul for. Uh, it really determines specifically on what's going on. So let's say that you have a, a good disc height, L5-S1, and a disc bulge pressing on a nerve. Uh, that would be more candidate for the culture procedure to try to get rid of the disc bulge. Let's say it's a degenerated disc that's pancaked out at L5-S1, meaning it's, it's collapsed. Then that's more the, the DDD procedure that's performed here in the U.S., or if it were a painful disc at L5-S1, same-day stem cells work really well on painful discs. So again, it's very specific to what's going on. Um, let's see. Uh, you mentioned that people look at all that one. Uh, any stem cell injections used to prevent a CMC arthroplasty? Uh, yes. So we treat CMC joint arthritis uh, quite a bit. In fact, I just treated a woman down in Grand Cayman, Cayman with CMC joint. Uh, arthritis, uh, uh, and uh, so we, we treat quite a, a bit or quite a few patients. I think we've treated about 200 in total that have CMC uh, or CMC thumb, base of the thumb type arthritis. Um, is there an advantage in getting treatment for arthritis sooner than later? Yeah, Neil, I, I do believe that getting treatment earlier is a good idea. I think that as all of this technology advances, we'll see more and more impetus for patients to be treated earlier rather than later. I think patients will generally do better when they're treated earlier. Um, so yes, I think it's a good idea to try to catch this earlier. Uh, let's see, I have C1C2 instability and I've been getting PRP and prolotherapy over the past year with some improvements. I'm still having severe symptoms. Is stem cell something that may help my case? Um, yeah, that's certainly uh, possible, um, Katie. You know, the, the problem with upper cervical instability is that the ligaments that can be reached easily um, sometimes won't resolve it, meaning the, there are internal ligaments, the ALAR and the transverse ligament that can be injected. Um, now, that's a complex injection. We're the only folks in the world, I believe, that do it. Uh, it's a procedure we pioneered. Um, and it requires uh, an approach from the front, not from the back. So um, long story short is, yes, there are stem cell solutions for C1, C2 instability, um, and, but it's a kind of a, a new uh, type procedure that we've been performing this last year and a half that accesses those ligaments that traditional prolotherapy or PRP can't reach. Um, let's see, uh, Makado, uh, Makado, Makoto, sorry. Um, yeah, so Makoto, you're asking a question about the knee um, infographics. If you go online, um, you'll be able to see those infographics. That it's at regenx.com, R-E-G-E-N-X-X.com, and staff can also help you point help point you in the right direction there. Um, and all that information is available uh, online. Um, so uh, Katie again asked a question, are we able to treat ALAR and transverse ligaments uh, in the um, spine? And the answer is yes, we can treat those with stem cells uh, or PRP, um, so e either way. Um, so Terry asked if uh, he's a good candidate. Um, Uh, Terry, I'm not quite sure what joint you're talking about. I think the way you've um, the way you've sourced this 
question or, or pose this question is that this was a hip arthritis uh, situation. So if you have mild hip arthritis uh, with good range of motion of that hip, then you would be a good candidate for the, uh, the same-day procedure. Um, Carol, uh, with a rotator cuff tear on the tendon, which is fairly severe, is surgery needed along with injection of the stem cells? Yeah, Carol, good question. A lot of that depends on how severe that is, meaning that um, their rotator cuff tears come in different types. You've got you know, a partial tear, which is only just some tear in the tendon itself. You've got a complete through and through tear, but the ends are still together, that's non-retracted. Then you've got a massive tear, which is through and through, and the ends come apart like a rubber band. Um, we can treat the first two. The last part is more difficult to treat through a needle, although still in some cases um, feasible. Um, so for instance, the, uh, the uh, Olympic skater that you saw, his was more like that. The, the latter kind. Um, and if it does need to be treated with surgery, there's a, some research out that shows that injecting stem cells afterwards can reduce the re-tear rate or um, the uh, likelihood that the whole thing's going to tear apart. Um, okay, guys, it's getting around uh, 6.15 here. And a uh, uh, couple different options from here on out. Uh, one is I've answered some questions. Uh, two is that uh, our folks will stay on chat, and uh, you're welcome to ask them questions. They're all experts. They've been doing this work a long time, answering a lot of questions. Anything that they can't answer, they can obviously throw my way. And then, obviously, you can schedule a time to speak with one of our folks at your convenience and do that right now in that lower right-hand corner. So uh, those are your options. I really appreciate you taking the time to be here tonight. I know it's uh, sometimes difficult after a long Monday slogging it back um, to show up to something like this. So I really appreciate your time. And have a wonderful week. And uh, let us know if we can help you with any of your uh, orthopedic issues. Thank you so much.